Bonjour, bienvenue sur France 24. Hello and welcome to France 24 and RFI. We have the pleasure of speaking with Thomas Pesquet for a special interview via satellite with the International Space Station. Here in studio, I'm joined by Sylvain Rousseau. Hello. The ISS has seen a lot of activity these past few days, especially with the arrival of the new Russian module, the Emelin Nauka. The craft took off yesterday from Baikonur in Kazakhstan. Thomas Pesquet, hello, and thank you for joining us. You said when you arrived on the ISS that it felt a bit crazy crowded, especially since there's seven of you now instead of six. Will the arrival of the new module change anything in your daily lives? Yes, it will change things, especially for our Russian colleagues in the Made in Russia part of the station. It will give them an extra room. There will also be an extra toilet, so it will make living conditions a bit easier for them. And above all, there will be a new scientific equipment that will allow the Russians to carry out even more research. It will make the station bigger, which makes sense. We've increased the use of the station, we've increased the number of people on board, and well, now we're adding a slightly larger module to the station, an extra room. So the Nauka module is still in orbit. It will carry out maneuvers for several days before docking with the ISS. There seem to be some technical issues concerning the module. Do you have any information about this? Do you know what's going on? Yes, we're well informed, of course, because uh, we're the most directly affected. We're the receivers, the main users of the product. The launch went very smoothly as far as the rocket and the launcher are concerned. Everything worked very well. Now we'll have to do several maneuvers to bring the module into orbit. It's not a very recent module. Unfortunately, there were several delays in production, some little accidents that had to be fixed. It's finally been launched in 2021, but maybe some of the technology is a bit dated. Things happened in the meantime, and maybe we waited a bit long. So it is it isn't really that surprising to see that everything isn't working absolutely perfectly. At the same time, it's an approach we're used to in the space community. There are redundancies, duplicated systems, especially where the Russians are concerned. We're used to having very reliable systems with lots of security, where even if the main system doesn't work, the backup will. And if the backup doesn't work, then there's always a plan C. That's sort of the Russian approach. We're regularly informed, whether by Moscow or Houston, which is following things closely. Because obviously, when you add a module to the ISS, it's something that affects everyone. It's not just one country's business that involves all the partners. So there's a continuous flow of information. We're following things closely and we're keeping our fingers crossed. Let's hope all goes well and that we'll soon be able to receive our new module and our new equipment. We can't wait. For the time being, the International Space Station, the ISS, is scheduled to remain operational until 2028. So that's just seven years before that final date. Does it really make sense? Is it really useful to add another module? Yes, it is useful. What you need to remember, as I said earlier, is that it's a module that was designed to be launched a couple years ago, more than a couple of years ago, actually. I think it was in 2013, so we're a bit behind schedule. But these aren't new costs. The costs were incurred years ago, and they've been absorbed. And I think 2028 is a date everyone has agreed to. But that doesn't mean we're not allowed to think the ISS will be able to go on for a bit longer. It will depend on many things. What are the programs will be carried out, how quickly we'll return to the moon, um, how ambitious we are. But it's definitely not out of the question to believe the ISS could go on for a bit longer and even beyond 2028. Well, that's the agreed end date that everyone signed off on for the existing partnership that brings together all the international space stations. But if one agency, for example, our Russian colleagues, decide to keep going, there's nothing stopping them from separating their part of the space station and to keep it flying. They can do it by themselves. It isn't a problem. I'm not saying it's easy, but it isn't impossible either. So the new module is something something realistic, it'll give them possibilities they haven't had up until now, and for the partnership, well, I think it will strengthen its momentum, and hopefully that'll take us a bit beyond 2028. Since your arrival, you have already been on three spacewalks in order to install two solar panels. So three spacewalks that uh, were rather quite long. Within just a week, how do you feel after such a marathon?
Well, well, I can tell you that you have no trouble sleeping afterwards during the weekend, although at that time we were also working during the weekend. It was intense. But we felt good. We felt good because we managed to install those solar panels, and that wasn't a given. The first spacewalk didn't go entirely to plan, and the tasks were really quite challenging, as our American friends say. I remember my first spacewalks during my first mission four years ago. It was a bit like playing a video game in beginner mode, where everything things a bit easy. And now we're playing exactly the same video game with the same environment, but it's suddenly been put into difficult mode. And well, it's a completely different ball game. We had to deal with heavy loads, a complicated choreography with the robotic arm. We were close to the solar panels. There was always a bit of stress. We always had to be careful about what we were doing. It was a much more dizzying feeling than what I'd done before. And it was much more difficult physically. We had trouble installing those panels. And so in the end, we were really very, very happy. And I must admit, slightly relieved that we managed to do it because we weren't going about it lightheartedly. We were really focused on the task at hand. It's also an important modification for the ISS. It's something that was needed. Solar panels age. We now have 35 or 40 percent extra power generation from the circuits where we installed those two solar panels. So it's important. Everyone's happy. It's something that we really couldn't mess up. So we were under quite a bit of pressure. In the end, we were very happy that it went well. We were a bit tired. There were aches and pains all over, but we'd be ready to do it all over again if we had to. You just said that installing the solar panels was quite complicated. You originally supposed to do two spacewalks, but you ended up doing three. So what's your override feeling then? Were you frustrated as a professional at not being able to get the job done right the first time? Or were you mainly satisfied as an astronaut being able to go out in space for an extra third time? What was the overall feeling for you? No, well, it was mainly frustrating. Of course, when we talk about it in a few years or a few months, I'll surely say I was happy to have had three spacewalks instead of two, even though that's not really what counts. But it's extra experience, which is always a good thing. And it's really a phenomenal feeling. So you're happy to have experienced it. But at the time, well, you're not there to look at the scenery or enjoy the job. You're there to really just get the job done. So that that's what we were focused on, and it was really the only thing that mattered to us. We'd have done five or six spacewalks if we had to, to install those solar panels. Coming back from the f first spacewalk, the mood wasn't really, I mean, we weren't demoralized, but the mood wasn't great because we were telling ourselves that it was going to be difficult. And in the end, thanks to the teams on the ground who came up with solutions, who found other ways to get things done, who really moved mountains to allow us to get back out there in record time and install the panels. Well. Thanks to all of this, the second spacewalk went very well, and we were quite confident during the third, and so everything went well. Now, I'm happy to have done three, but if we'd have been able to get the job done in two, I'd have really been just as happy. So this is your second mission aboard the International Space Station. How did you find things when you returned back onto the ISS? Was everything the way you'd left it? Had things changed? Were there any surprises? There weren't any major surprises. It's a bit like going back to somewhere you used to go when you were little. You realize it's changed a bit, but maybe there's a, a new sign up above the local bakery. But otherwise, everything is more or less where it's supposed to be. It's a bit like that here. There are a few new things here and there, a few things that have changed places. There's a lot of new scientific equipment. That's the main thing that's changed. The modules, the walls are the same. The structure is the same. The way you... Uh, get around, how you wash, how you exercise, how you eat. None of that has changed. But some of the day-to-day -day activities have. I was familiar with some of them from my last time here because long-lasting projects need a lot of subjects, a lot of time, but there's also loads of new things. And that's what's cool. No two missions are alike. You can come here three times, like some have, like my colleague Peggy, with whom I came here the first time did. You can do three long-term missions and you never get bored because there's always something to do and the program is constantly being renewed, and that's great. So these are long-term missions, and it's true that you're in space uh, and you possibly have the most beautiful view that exists anywhere, but you're also in a station that's quite cramped and you're far from your loved ones. Is it sometimes difficult day-to-day -day dealing with these things? Sometimes do you feel time is taking too long?
Yes, time can feel like it's going too slowly, for sure. Strangely enough, more this time than the first. Psychologically speaking, I think the second mission is a bit more difficult, perhaps because there's less of the joy of discovery, the excitement of saying to yourself, I'm in space and it might be the only time in my life. The first time I really wanted to do everything. I kept telling myself that six months isn't that long. I wanted to call every one of my friends. I wanted to take a photo of every place on Earth I had never been. I wanted to do everything you can do in space all in one go because I didn't know if I'd be coming back. I managed to do a lot of these things, but not everything. This time I feel there's less pressure. I feel like I have a bit more time. And yes, maybe there's a bit less of that excitement, so it makes things a bit more difficult. That being said, there are plenty of difficult jobs. I'm thinking of soldiers or long-haul travelers, stuff like that. It's all part of the job. It's not the most fun part, but we're lucky in the ISS. We can still communicate by email, by telephone, by video call. So we try to focus on positive things and we remain patient and we all know that it'll be great when we return to Earth. Thomas Pesquet, you told us before the launch that this time you were hoping to make a bit more time for yourself, even if it meant uh, doing a little less PR work. Uh, have you managed to do that? Because honestly, from Earth, it doesn't look like you have. Honestly, no, not at all. I, I haven't managed at all. I did try, but it's the FOMO, the fear of missing out, as they say online. Uh, on the weekend, I say to myself, OK, I'm going to take an hour for myself. And then I realize we'll be flying over Europe in perfect weather conditions. And I just can't stop myself from looking through the window with my camera. And then there's also things I didn't do last time. I'm trying to innovate a bit. Now I'm trying to paste together tons of high resolution images to create an enormous picture in which you can zoom in as far as possible on huge cities such as Paris, LA or elsewhere. So that takes up a bit of my time. No, it's true, I had set myself that goal, but for now I've failed dismally. But we're not even halfway through the mission, so who knows, maybe in the second half I'll finally manage to relax in space. In any case, your efforts seem to be paying off since the European Space Agency, your employee, has launched an astronaut recruitment drive with a total of 20,000 applicants from all over Europe, of which a third are French. This is partly thanks to your outreach work, to what you're doing from space. This must be very satisfying for you. Yes, it's true that it's uh, very satisfying for me, not because it makes me feel proud personally, but because I think it's important, because even though all astronauts do some outreach work nowadays, it's clearly not part of our job. And we do invest a lot of ourselves personally in communicating. Some like to do so more than others or want to devote their leisure times doing this more than others, because that's how it usually works. I've done it a lot because I believe it was useful, because my parents are teachers and for many other reasons, because because I would have liked to have a French-speaking astronaut explain to me what life in space is like when I was little, and I was obsessed with this, but I couldn't get much information. So I really tried to communicate a lot and put a lot of effort into it, a lot of energy. And yes, it seems to be paying off. Of course, it's not only thanks to me, obviously. You mustn't focus too much on yourself, but I've played my part, and it's great. It means that people have got the message, they've understood that space is important, that science, research, discovery, progress are important, that they're not just empty words, and above all, they've understood that you just have to go for it. That's something that really makes me happy, that these people, they're not all amazing jet pilots. They haven't all gone to the best schools, and yet they're giving it a try and applying anyway. And that's precisely the message I want to get out there, that you have to go for it and seize these kinds of adventures, and it's only by deciding to walk the path that you'll get anywhere, so you mustn't stay on the sidelines. So that's really something that makes me very, very happy. My only reservation is that there could have been more girls. If 50% of the applicants were girls, that would be fantastic, and I could remember tire immediately. That's not what's happened, but who knows, maybe there'll be one more French woman astronaut after Claudie in the next election, and maybe in the generation after that we'll finally get there and have gender equality. There's been a lot of talk about space down here on Earth, in particular because of the suborbital flights carried out by Richard Branson and even more recently by Jeff Bezos with Blue Origin. There's been a lot of talk about space tourism, 
Another thing that's been talked about is filming in space. The Russians and the Americans, with Tom Cruise in a star role, are thinking of making a movie in space. And this brings me to my last question, Thomas Pesquet. For your acting debut, would you rather star in a Russian film or a Hollywood blockbuster? I want to say neither. I think it would probably be more like a bad French film, since my acting skills are really extremely limited. And I'm being rather kind to myself. But it's true. There's a lot of things going on in space. I don't know if I'll still be here then. No, I'll no longer be here in the ISS when all these people get here. Maybe I'll be like the Russians, but we'll see. But it's a good thing. It means stuff is happening. But then I believe the goal of all of this has to have an impact on everyone. So private investment in space is a good thing if it helps develop new technologies and capacities like SpaceX is doing. That's great. But the end goal has to be a virtuous one. There's nothing wrong with people going on little trips in space. But at the end of the day, we're trying to do something more. We're trying to do something for others. We're trying to do research, exploration. We're trying to share all of this in the name of progress. So what's important to me is when all these projects try to embody these kinds of values. We'll see what the future holds. Uh, it's like with aviation. It started as a rich man's hobby, but now at least it allows people to travel, to discover each other. I like to think it makes the world a more peaceful place. We'll see what the future of private endeavors in space is, but let's hope it bears fruit along the same path that we've taken ourselves. Thank you very much, Thomas Pesquet. That wraps up our interview for today. Thanks for joining us from your office high in the International Space Station. We'll stay in touch throughout your mission there, and thanks to the logbooks that you've been sending us regularly. Stay tuned to France 24 and RFI.